Hi, good morning or afternoon. I hope that you're having a great day. Um, I'm sharing this book with you today because I have just finished a paper this semester on uh, quilting and learned a lot about quilting in the Appalachian area and the quilting traditions that were brought over uh, through the Scots Irish culture. So, in that, I discovered this little book at the local library and wanted to share it with you. It's called Quilting Now and Then. And this is by Karen Bates Willing and Julie Bates Doc. The illustrations are done by Sarah Morse. And I will just point out here on the cover, as you will notice throughout the rest of the book, there is a illustration, these are drawings, and then this is a photograph. Of an actual quilt. So you'll see that throughout the book. It is a mix of uh, drawings and photographs of actual quilts. It's a lot of fun. Right, quilting now and then. The Johnson House is filled with colors everywhere you gaze. With checks and stars and polka dots, a winning, swirling maze. The walls aren't filled with paintings, no. It's fabric that you see, because Shirley Johnson is a quilter for her family. She's made a quilt for husband Tom it's folded on their bed. And quilts were made for all her kids. They're Sue and Hank and Fred. And Shirley has quilts piled upon each chair and bed and table. And lots of quilts in progress that she'll finish when she's able. She likes to share her newest quilts with people that she knows. She also shows off old ones made by women long ago. These quilts have seen her family's joys, their sorrow, and their tears. They've passed from mom to daughter over many, many years. She cherishes these precious quilts more ancient than the rest, and so she stores them in a box that's called a cedar chest. A cedar chest is made of wood that's from a cedar tree. Its musty smell keeps the moths away. Moths eat the quilts, you see. One day, the kids bring Charlie home to play with after school. He stares at all of Shirley's quilts and says, I think they're cool. But you don't think it's strange to hang a blanket on your wall? Mom calls them quilts, says Sue, who's never questioned it at all. But why are they called quilts, asks Charlie, adding one thing more, and what makes them so different from the blankets at the store? A blanket's just one layer, answers Shirley, but you see, a quilt has several layers. If you count, you'll find three. Please tell me how you make a quilt, says Charlie, full of wonder. So Shirley pulls out quilts that all the children snuggle under. And you could also tell us how they made quilts long ago. Did great-great-grandma Ruth make quilts like you do, yes or no? Did she choose from a hundred prints like you do at the store? And were the quilts all sewn by hand? And what is quilting for? And Shirley hollers, holy kids, your questions come too fast. I'll tell you how the quilts are made right now and in times past. Quilting's changed since Grandma's day. New gadgets make it fun. I'll start at the beginning so you'll learn how it was done. When great-great-grandma made her quilt, she also sewed her clothes, and those of all her household, that's a big job, heaven knows. 
Since she lived in the country far away from any store, a peddler sold her fabric as he traveled door to door. His horse-drawn cart was full of things to save a trip to town, along with tools and sugar. He had fabric for her gown. She hoarded every unused scrap when all the clothes were made. That's one way she got pieces for her quilting or to trade. And when the clothes seemed all worn out and hardly fit to wear, she found the parts she still could use and cut them out with care. But if her scraps were all the same and she lacked something bright, she'd swap her fabric with her friends to get the mix just right. I don't rely on clothing scraps like she did long ago, and I don't have to scrimp and save from dresses that I sew. I pick my pattern first instead and find the perfect fit of different colored fabrics that will soon go into it. Then Charlie asks, what patterns? I don't think I understand. And Shirley answers, pointing to the quilts that are at hand. Let's see what Fred is sitting on. It's called a Lone Star Quilt. There's one huge central star of tiny diamonds in it is built. And Sue is curled inside a quilt that's called a Sun Bonnet Sue. And Hank, you're in the nine patch made of squares all through and through. And Grandma's Flower Garden is the quilt that Charlie's on. Each tiny piece has six sides, and that's a hexagon. The patterns all have names that come from common country scenes. The schoolhouse and the courthouse steps and even corn and beans. The Bible gave us patterns too, like Star of Bethlehem, while nature gave us others, and you'd guess a lot of them, like flying geese and turkey tracks and bear's paw, Sue exclaims. There must be hundreds of them, and my mom knows all their names. Well, anyway, says Shirley, once she's picked what she's desired, a quilter cut out paper for each pattern shape required. The paper's called a template. On her fabric it would sit. She traces round its edges, careful not to jostle it. And when she had the shapes all marked, she got her scissors ready. To cut each piece precisely, she had both hands firm and steady. Those ladies cut each tiny piece by hand without a mutter. But now we have a great device that's called a rotary cutter. It's like a pizza cutter with a blade both sharp and round. It rolls through fabric layers, cutting shapes without a sound. And I have a plastic template that replaces the paper ones. The cutter rolls against them and the job is quickly done. Wow, what a lot of work, says Fred. And it's not nearly through. Well, now she gets out her machine and shows, sews it up, says Sue. Yes, darling, that's what I do now. But in times long past, great grandma had to sew by hand. It wasn't quite as fast. Yet after many weeks and months with stitches small and tight, she turned that pile of ragged scraps into a lovely sight. And now she pieced the fabric that would go onto the back. She used the largest piece she could find within her stack. Between the top and bottom, she would put a filling light. I know the stuff you mean, says Sue. It's batting, am I right? Correct. The batting is like a sheet of cotton or of wool, or sometimes polyester, and it makes the quilt look full. In olden days, the batten didn't come from any store. The quilter pulled and stretched raw cotton flat upon the floor. Since batting was so hard to make, a quilter who was smart would use a tattered quilt as a bat and give it a new start. The purpose is the same no matter what the bat quilts used. It traps warm air inside the quilt. The layers next are fused. The quilt top stretched across the floor on batting and on back. Then all three layers must be joined with stitches large and slack. Those stitches are called basting. They will hold it all in place. 
while tiny quilting stitches form a pattern you can trace. Sometimes the stitches form a leaf, a flower, or a feather. Their job is most important for they hold the quilt together. I often quilt with my machine, but that's a modern way. The early quilters sewed by hand their quilting to display. The tiniest of stitches were the toughest to achieve, but sometimes they got 20 to the inch, I do believe. The pioneers used quilting frames to hold the layers tight while pulling needles up and down from morning until night. And sometimes a quilting bee, the women got together to quilt their tops beneath the trees if it was sunny weather. The women shared both food and talk while quilting all the day, but children had a lot more fun beneath the quilts they to play. This work was quite important for the ladies all knew well that quilts were needed for their warmth in the winter when the snow fell. And so young girls were taught to sew as early as age four, a girl would thread the needles and soon she was doing more. For the, by the time she got engaged, a young girl cedar chest should be store a dozen finished quilts and now she'd quilt her best. Her bridal quilt showed off the skills she'd practiced day and night. The quilting shown all by itself, the quilt was white on white. Mm -hmm. right. Today at Special Quilt Shows, folks can come from far and wide to see fantastic modern quilts and old ones side by side. A very few have names or dates to tell us of their past, but most have no such messages. They hold their secrets fast. And that's the reason that I add my signature and date to every quilt that I complete a message to relate. So now you kids go check your quilts. They'll tell you where and when, and why I made them for you with my name in purple pen. And when her kids are all upstairs, then Shirley with a grin uncovers her old cedar chest so she can look within. See, Charlie, here's a quilt that came from my great-grandma Pearl, and here's one her mother made when she was just a girl. Your quilts are neat. I sure have learned from what you showed to me. I wish I had a Lone Star quilt like Charlie, said Charlie longingly. And so you will, cried Shirley with a sparkle in her eye. I'll make you one, so let's go pick the fabric, you and I. And Charlie jumps excitedly to think he'll have one too. I hope you know a quilter who will make a quilt for you. you enjoyed this little story and that if you have the opportunity to have a handmade quilt that you take advantage of it they are precious treasures uh, I have one that my grandmother made for me all right have a great day